You've no doubt heard someone say, seeing is believing. You've probably also heard a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Now those things may sometimes make sense if you're talking about a, a game show or some other situation. For example, I remember getting home as a kid after school and watching Monty Hall and Let's Make a Deal. In one of that show's formats, Monty would just pick some lady out of the audience and offer her a prize of $50 or $100 if she could produce a tube of lipstick out of her purse. And if she did, when she produced that tube of lipstick, he'd give her the $100. But then he would offer her a chance to trade that $100 in for another prize that was hidden behind the door. The prize behind the door could be a brand new car, new expensive television set, a brand new washer and dryer, or it could be a live goat, which is one of their favorite things, or a pack of gum, or something else of very little value. Many game shows today, not that I watch them, I don't, have some variation of that theme. You reach a certain level and then must decide to quit while you're ahead or take a chance and try to advance to the next level and win a prize of more value or more money. You can keep what you have, the bird in hand, so to speak, or you can take a chance at winning the two in the bush. The problem is sometimes the bush is empty or the birds get away and you go home empty-handed. I'll give you another example. Here is a $20 bill. My wife's in California, it's the only reason I have one. Which you can see, you can touch, you can smell it, you can hear it. Let's say I offer you a choice. You can accept this $20 bill right now which you can see and touch and take possession of right away. Or you can choose to accept a $1,000 check made out in your name that I have in my house but you cannot see and you'll have to wait a little while for it. Which would you choose? Thing that you can touch and feel right now or the thing that you cannot see and we'll have to wait for a little while, but is of much more value. Think about that a while. During the last few weeks, we have gone over the first five verses of 1 Peter chapter 1. Let us now pick up with verse 6 and read through verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 6 through 9. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And we'll stop there. In this you rejoice. What does the word this refer to? Well, it refers to all the things that we've been talking about the last few weeks and which Peter has been writing about. First off, God the Father has caused us to be born again to a living hope. We are saved. We who were dead in our sins and trespasses have now received a spiritual rebirth as a free gift from God according to the great mercy and love with which he loves us. 
secondly, our spiritual rebirth is based on none other than the works of Jesus Christ, his son, who died on a Roman cross for the sins of the world and who was resurrected by the power of God that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. That historical fact assures us of God's ability to resurrect the dead and assures us that one day we too will be resurrected as Jesus was. Ours is a living hope based on a living Savior and not on some still dead mythical person still lying in the grave. Our Savior is alive and well and seated at the right hand of God, always making intercession for us, even at this very moment. Thirdly, we have an inheritance coming to us as children of God that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for us, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Matthew 6.20 Fourthly, verse 5 tells us that it is God's power that is guarding us so that it does not depend on us. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We cannot lose our salvation once we have been declared not guilty in God's court of law. This happens the moment we place our trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins after first confessing our sins, repenting of them, and admitting that we are indeed sinners in need of rescue. Not even the Supreme Court can overturn God's verdict. There is no other court in the land, no higher authority, higher than God, the creator of the universe. Nothing in the entire world, including our future failures and unfaithfulness, can snatch us from the hand of God. Not even the devil himself, O oh, Diabolos. And these things, in this we rejoice. A Christian ought to be the most joyous person on earth, filled with inexpressible inner joy that those who are lost cannot possibly understand, even though for a short while we must endure trials. Now, rejoicing and trials do not seem to go together, especially if you take a worldly view. But Peter tells us that we should rejoice because, as he points out, our trials are only for a little while, and sometimes they are necessary. Peter, you see, is taking a long-term heavenly view. James makes the same point in his epistle in chapter 1, verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Again, that's James 1, verse 2. Jesus said in John 16, 33, In the world you will have tribulation. Peter makes the point in verse 6 that these trials are only for a little while. Paul says the same thing in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul considers our suffering in this world and grief as light and momentary when compared to the glory that awaits us in the future. The eternal weight of glory, as he puts it, far outweighs our light, temporary suffering. He says that we should not look to the things that we see, which are only temporary, but to the things that are unseen and eternal. That is where the illustrations that I began with come into play. You can focus on the things that are in front of you 
like the $20 bill. Or you can look forward to something of much more value, like the check I have with your name on it, even though you have to wait a little while to receive it, and you cannot now see it. The same goes for the trials and tribulations we face in this life. We can focus on them and allow them to drain away all of our energy and our hope. Or we can concentrate and focus on our future inheritance, which is our final glorification and eternal life in the presence of God, which is far better than anything this earth has to offer. If you trust in Christ, really, really trust in Christ in your innermost being for your salvation, you have that future to look forward to. And as we have made abundantly clear over the last few weeks, that inheritance is based on a solid foundation, unlike the check that I have at home. There is no guarantee that my check, written on the bank of the Trinity, <laughs> will clear the bank. But with God, everything he says and promises is guaranteed, sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, I should point out that not everything we consider a trial should bring us joy. We must differentiate between testing for the purpose of maturity and the consequences of sin. When we are going through unwanted circumstances that are brought about by our own bad choices or by disobedience to the Word of God, it should not bring us any joy. Many of our so-called trials are nothing more than the consequences of sin. There is no joy to be found in that. Rather, there should be an appropriate amount of sorrow, of godly sorrow, leading us to repentance because we have sinned against our Lord and Savior. Not sorrow that we got caught, but godly sorrow because we have disobeyed our Lord and Master. These so-called trials are of our own making. It is often our own fault that we get into bad situations and bad things happen to us. When we make bad choices, we have no one to blame but ourselves. Just look in the mirror. And that should not bring us any joy of the kind that Peter is talking about. There is no reward for enduring the consequences of your own sin. Proverbs 6.27 asks, Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? If you make an unwise decision or do something really stupid, like putting hot coals in your lap, you're probably going to get burned. And there are a lot of stupid decisions we can make and do make and suffer the consequences those are consequences. So which trials should bring us joy and where do these trials come from? We know from the book of Genesis that Satan himself puts temptation before us in an attempt to cause us to stumble in sin. And these temptations by Satan are certainly trials that we must struggle to overcome. Satan is the devil's name. And it means adversary, and that is who he is. He is the adversary of God, and he opposes everything God wants to accomplish. Devil, diabolos, means accuser and slanderer, and that is what he does. He accuses us and slanders us all day long. The devil has a host of fallen angels to assist him in carrying out his assault against Christians and Christianity, against God and mankind. These fallen angels are what we refer to as demons. They are spiritual beings, and there is great spiritual warfare 
going on around us that we cannot see. The demons try to influence our mind and our behavior and try to compel us to act against God's will for our lives. The weakness of our own flesh is an accomplice, is an accomplice and makes his job easier. In his adversarial role, Satan has many tools available to entice us to sin. Sometimes he appeals directly to our senses, like he did with Jesus in the wilderness when he appealed to his human hunger, his eyes, and his human desire for safety and health. He tempted him to turn the stones into bread to satisfy his hunger. He showed his eyes all the kingdoms of the world and said, These I will give to you if you will just worship me. And it challenged him to throw himself down to prove that God would protect his health. In other words, the devil was giving Jesus a health and wealth message like so many of our corrupt televangelists and word of faith preachers do today. The devil desires that we should worship him, not God. He will use every means available to drive a wedge between us and God. It is though our enemy shops at Home Depot because he has a toolbox full of to tools and a wedge is one of his favorite ones. He uses the power of suggestion like he did with Judas Iscariot in John 13 too. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. He uses our own weakness to bait us into sin. As the great deceiver, fishing for souls, he dangles the falsehood that great gain can be had by doing certain things and then deceiving us into believing that these things are okay. There's nothing wrong with them. If he told us the truth about them, we would never take the bait if we knew the outcome of what he is trying to get us to do. Just ask Eve and Adam. The devil is a cunning liar. Quote, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. John 8, 44. He inflicts human beings with disease and suffering like he did Job. God allows this to happen. He allowed it to happen to Job in order to prove a point to Satan. But the reason for the trials and grief and agony that came upon Job were never explained to him. He had no idea of the spiritual warfare going on. Two things should be noted here. Satan is our enemy and can bring about situations that we rightfully consider trials and tribulations. God allows certain trials to take place. He may just simply allow them or he may send one our way in order to test us and prove our faith, not to him but to ourselves. And there is a subtle difference between trials and temptations, though temptations can certainly be trials. They are like the opposite sides of the same coin. On one side, God uses trials to make us stronger and never has the intention of making us sin. But on the other side, Satan uses temptation in order to cause us to stumble. God uses it to test us. Satan uses it to make us fail. Keep in mind that God will never tempt us to sin. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone to sin. James 1.13 Second, our own natural impulse toward evil results in situations that we call trials. No amount of praying, no amount of good works, no amount of church attendance, no amount of anything can rid us of our fallen nature. We will have it until we die or the rapture occurs. 
Our own actions can result in unwanted circumstances that we have no one to blame for but ourselves. These are consequences of sin rather than trials that test our faithfulness. We may even be suffering God's discipline, which has a purpose all its own. So the trials that should bring us joy are the trials that come upon us because we are Christians and not the trials that result from our failure to walk as Christians. When we follow Jesus Christ and do our best to obey His Word in this lost world, it can lead to persecution from our friends and our enemies. When that occurs, we are suffering with Christ and for His cause. And these trials come in many different shapes and sizes in all kinds of flavor. Satan is the prince of this world and of the world's system, and he uses it to persecute Christians and the Christian faith. While we are no longer burned at the stake in this country, and nor do we face jail time, at least not yet, we do face persecution in the press, in our jobs, from our neighbors, from strangers. As a Christian, we face trials all the time, whether we recognize it or not. If we are a business owner in this world today, it is hard to succeed sometimes against a competitor who will do whatever it takes to make money. Your competitor may lie, steal, cheat, whatever, in order to get ahead and make money. A Christian should never do those things in order to have a successful business. You may be faced with situations every day where you have to choose between God's moral law and the secular ethics of this secular business world. It is not easy to do. It is very hard, but it can be done. Chick-fil-A is evidently an example of a successfully run Christian-operated business model. But you may have to settle for less success than your competition because you are not willing to take advantage of your customers and violate God's principles. So you're persecuted in that way. In the same way, you may work for a supervisor or a company that asks you to do something that is wrong. They may demand that you fudge on the books if you're in accounting. A car dealership might ask its salesman or tell its salesman not to reveal everything about that used car in order to sell it. What do you do? Go find another job? Your boss or the company you work for may take a hateful attitude and demand that you work on Sunday rather than go to church. Sometimes we have to work on Sunday. But I have been told many times about bosses with such a hateful, anti-Christian attitude that they make their employers work on Sunday because they know that they're Christian. They do it just for spite because they can't stand them Christians. I'm sure that many of you have been sneered at in the past and have been verbally abused when you try to talk about your Christianity or Jesus Christ. This is a lost and fallen world that we live in, and we are in the minority. As dispensationalists that take the Bible literally, we are even more of a minority in this church. Too many people and preachers today have gotten away from a literal, grammatical interpretation of the Scriptures and preach a listener-friendly gospel rather than the 2,000-year-old gospel truth. Sometimes the kitchen gets too hot and they move on down the road and find a church that tickles their ears and suits their fancy rather than face the truth. They somehow believe that the hierarchical church and its man-made traditions will usher in a golden age of peace and prosperity, and they put way too much confidence in humanity. But all we must do 
is look at Jesus' parable about the wheat and tares in Matthew 13 to know that this is not so. Allow me to read it to you. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, less than gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now the wonderful thing about that parable is that Jesus interprets it for us starting with verse 37. The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, the devil. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their fathers. He who has ears... Let him hear. We will always be subject to trials, tribulations in this age, all the way through until the end of the millennium. There will be weeds among the wheat. And these human weeds, like Satan's demons, his fallen angels, will cause us grief. Some of our grief is a result of the fact that nature itself has been cursed as a result of the fall. Sickness, disease, and war, and famine, and cancer, and all other social and physical ills are a result of the fall and the degradation of this fallen world. Satan has been given control of the world system for a short while. And people who have been blinded by Satan will always be opposed to Christians and Christianity. We see it in the news outlets and we read it in the newspapers, at least those of us who can still read do. Our educational system has fallen victim to the world's values and our children no longer learn how to read and write properly because teachers no longer care about teaching and parents don't take parenting seriously anymore. Many people, especially our youth, no longer engage in face-to-face -face conversation but text each other in shameful English. They don't use complete sentences. They don't spell out whole words. It's no wonder so many job applications are tossed in the trash. And when was the last time you saw anyone under the age of 50 with a newspaper in their hand or a good non-fiction book? Not that most newspapers are worth reading. So attacks against Christianity and against Christians come from all quarters. We are grieved by trials that come through sickness and disease from the world system, from modern culture, and from fallen people. We are even grieved by people who call themselves Christians but are only so on outward appearances. Sometimes they are the worst kind, causing us the most grief and the most trial. That Christian that just makes our life miserable. But Peter says, along with James and Paul, that we should rejoice and count it all joy when we suffer in behalf of Jesus Christ. For one thing, these things, these troubles, are only for a little while. If you live to be a hundred, it doesn't compare to eternity. 
I asked the question a while back. How many here own their own home? Don't raise your hand. How will you answer that question 100 years from now? 50 years from now, some of us. This life is short. And sometimes Peter says these trials are necessary. Well, why are they necessary, you ask? They are necessary in order for God to perfect us, to work sanctification in us, and to prepare us for our future inheritance that we ought to be looking forward to. Just like gold must be melted down to the liquid state in order to remove the dross and impurities, we must feel the heat of trials and tribulations to remove the impurities from our own selves. How we react to these trials give proof of the genuineness of our faith like it did Job. A faith that according to Peter is more precious than all the gold of this world. Gold and its inherent value will perish even though it's been tested by fire. But our heavenly inheritance never will. And when genuine faith is found in us, it will result in praise and glory and honor when Christ comes again and reveals himself to us. And he's coming, and he's coming soon. And when he does, we will obtain our full inheritance, which is the total salvation of our souls, absent of the sin nature, pure and holy and immortal, and we will be like him. So if you're having a bad hair day, go to Walmart, get a brush, and get over it. It won't last long. If you are suffering because you are associated with Christ, rejoice. If you are suffering because you're being tested for your faithfulness, rejoice. For that too only lasts a little while. And enduring such suffering makes you a better Christian, more complete, more mature. Our suffering, our grief, our pain, our sins, our diseases, our cancers, our illnesses, death of our loved ones, these only last for a little while. If we concentrate only on these things that are before us, like that $20 bill I showed you earlier, we can lose our faith and our confidence. But if we concentrate and focus on the heavenly things that are not seen, on our inheritance that are waiting for us, that are being kept in heaven by the power of God, we can look forward with great joy to what lies ahead and we will be better prepared to face the trials, these momentary afflictions of ours that we have today. So take care of the situations now, yes, in a Christian manner. But don't look our pains and our illnesses and the things before us now steal our joy of the inheritance that we have coming. Let us have an upward view, a heavenly view of things, looking forward to our inheritance. It wasn't long ago I could still play baseball and run with the best of them. Then all of a sudden, here I am, 56 years old, couldn't walk across the ground, couldn't walk around the block without losing my breath. It goes by fast is what I'm telling you. It goes by fast and then we'll be facing Jesus Christ. And then we'll have eternity. Let us focus on those things and not these light, temporary afflictions we face today because we have a better future coming. 